then what are these vegetations doctor here you are able to see the vegetations so these are the small pink vegetations in the right uppermost cusp, cusp margin it is seen in the case of the non bacterial thrombotic uh, endocarditis and these are also called merantic endocarditis and typically they will be pale in color and uh, it is not associated with any valve damage unlike the Lipman Sachs endocarditis is what need to be basically remembered. Now what predisposes to this merantic endocarditis is my question to all of you. Any hypercoagulable state, if there is any underlying malignancy like the Trousio syndrome, very ill patients can develop the merantic endocarditis. Lastly comes your infective endocarditis, typically it is uh, cause, sometimes caused by virulent destructive organism like Staph aureus in a non diseased valve or if it is a diseased valve because of rheumatic heart disease it can be because of a less virulent organism like the Streptococcus viridans is something that should not be basically forgotten. So finally what is our answer for this question doctor? It is um, the Lippmann Sachs endocarditis is what you can confidently answer for this question. Let's go to the next question. Type 2 respiratory failure our favorite question has come. So it is the PSCO2 increased and uh, a low PO2 is called type 2. Normal PSCO2 with a low PO2 is called as the type 1. Pulmonary edema like parenchymal level diseases lead to type 1 respiratory failure. Whereas the bronchus, trachea at a higher level problems lead to type 2 respiratory failure is what has to be basically remembered. Let's go to the next question. H. pylori can cause gastric ulcer, duodenal ulcer and the gastric lymphoma is what has to be basically remembered. Aplastic anemia and sickle cell anemia, standard question, is caused by the parvovirus B19. H. pylori, can it cause anemia doctor? Definitely when it causes so many ulcers it leads to blood loss leading to iron deficiency anemia is what need to be fundamentally remembered. Anybody answered hemolytic or any other choices? Sometimes for a few questions we need to relatively think much easier. That's what the examiner asks you. That is, uh, earlier questions you were in the ozone layer. Can you come down onto the ground and think for this question? That is required, no? Sometimes uh, in OPD suddenly you have a patient with malignancy. Next patient is having infective endocarditis. Next patient may be having simple malaria. Malaria patient also if you start treating him like uh, infective endocarditis, then all problems come. So examiner in entrance checks all that doctor. Let's go to the next question. Pulmonary embolism, what is the wells grading in pulmonary embolism? Very interesting question. Please remember, there are about uh, uh, seven criteria which are given in the wells grading. If the pulmonary embolism is more likely than the alternatives based on the given situation. If the DVT is suspected and uh, you have shown it by the Doppler. Tachycardia, surgery or any immobilization. And the prior DVT or pulmonary embolism, presence of hemoptysis, if there is any active malignancy which is prothrombotic and can predispose to pulmonary embolism, they are all considered the risk factors accordingly. The Wells has given a grading for proclivity, possibility, probability of developing the pulmonary embolism. There is a reason, Dr. Hemoptysis, Doppler, HR, all these are important. Homan sign and all these clinical symptoms are not included in the Wells grading, is uh, what I like to conclude on this particular question. Let us go to the next question. Favorite question once more for us, n number of Sunday discussions we had this question. The giant A waves typically are seen in which of uh, the various conditions. So this question anyway is going to come uh, many number of times doctor. Even tomorrow in MD general medicine finally and also they will fail you based on the JVP. That is the reason you have to know. So don't ask me is what I want to tell you. So remember ask me is uh, the typical code. A wave matches the atrial filling. C wave is not because of systole, it corresponds to the ventricular systole in its timing. Then uh, X descent is because of that closer to tricuspid valve and uh, the maximal atrial filling occurs at the time of this uh, V wave and uh, when the atrium empties then it leads to the fall in the form of the Y descent. So ask me, atrial filling Systole, closed tricuspid, maximum atrial filling, emptying of the atrium. A wave, C wave, X descent, V wave, Y descent uh, should not be basically forgotten in relation to JVP. Now any question, any entrance you have to remember, ask me is going to be your uh, Q word. Now typically S1 will occur with two important waves. That is with the A wave and with the C wave. Whereas the S2 will be corresponding with the V wave is what I want to underscore to all of you. When will the maximum atrial filling occurs, doctor? 
that is it will be corresponding to the time when the atrium ventricular i mean when the aortic and pulmonary valve are closing at the ventricular outlet that time atrium will be totally ready fully filled and it will be ready to deliver the blood into the ventricle for its diastole to begin so there's a reason s2 occur with the v wave and the s1 occurs with the a and c waves is what i want to underscore to all of you now let us talk about this giant a waves which are asked in this uh, uh, exam typically large a waves means increased resistance for the filling of the right atrium what situations will make right atrium filling difficult job if there is any pulmonary stenosis if there is any tricuspid stenosis with the right ventricular hypertrophy that all will make the a waves become very large and visible in the neck is what i want to underscore to all of you typically atrial fibrillation if it is there when the atria is not contracting at all then the a waves will be totally absent is what has to be basically remembered then um, the dominant a wave we see in the case of the pulmonary stenosis and pulmonary hypertension tricuspid stenosis not the regurgitation and the canon a waves are seen uh, at the time of the complete heart block or if there is any vt or if there is any paroxysmal nodal tachycardia and when do you see the dominant v wave doctor typically it is seen if there is any tricuspid regurgitation then the dominant v wave will be there so what the finding that you come across in the regurgitation tricuspid regurgitation is not the giant a wave it is a um, prominent v wave is what need to be remembered and the giant a wave seen the tricuspid stenosis pulmonary hypertension complete heart block junctional rhythm in all these situations is what i want to finally underscore to all of you then two more things are there exaggerated x descent sharp y descent and a slow y descent three conditions commonly asked in the entrance you need to remember cardiac tamponade in the constrictive pericarditis you will come across exaggerated x descent whereas in the case of the tricuspid regurgitation constrictive pericarditis sharp y descent and in the right atrial myxoma slow y descent that's the reason doctor in the constrictive pericarditis you come across both the exaggeration of the x descent and also the y descent because after all what happens in constrictive pericarditis heart is prevented from getting filled at any cost any time hence both x descent and also the y descent both of them will become much more uh, sharp uh, is what need to be basically remembered now in the case of the polyarthritis nodosa where do you see the aneurysmal dilatation i mean where you don't see is very important please remember doctor <coughs> pan and microscopic polyangiitis are two very close situations which differ from each other chapel hill has given a classification for this you need to remember one important point in this before we go to the next question microscopic polyangiitis will be involving the pulmonary capillaries but not the polyarthritis nodosa that is the fundamental difference between the two there's a reason polyarthritis nodosa can lead to this kind of aneurysmal dilatation which you are seeing here in this kidney um it also can lead to in the liver in the pancreas but not the lung is what i want to underscore to all of you we discussed this point many number of times upper lobe tuberculosis is because of what lymphatic or hematogenous spread is a very important question it is another challenging question i could not get a very confident answer at least i'll support one answer out of that hematogenous you are sure about but there are two reasons which are cited why in the post primary tuberculosis upper lobes are affected very commonly number one because there is a high oxygen there's a reason happily they will enjoy the honeymoon the uh, what you call the uh, mycobacteria second reason is if you compare the upper lobe versus that of the middle and the lower lobes upper lobes have got a diminished lymphatic drainage that's the reason they can't be drained out hence they remain over there and they will be able to persist by that logic lymphatic spread becomes the answer but uh, hematogenous is also equally possible you can decide eh, until the result comes so this is an example of a gons complex doctor where the hilar lymphadenopathy plus parenchymal lesions can coexist is what you have to basically remember <coughs> basically what are the two differences between primary and the post primary tb presence of cavitation absence of the hilar lymphadenopathy the differentiates post primary from primary is what need to be basically remembered what is felty syndrome rheumatoid arthritis plus anemia plus uh, the splenomegaly not the lymphadenopathy is the combination which is called the felty syndrome why will anemia occur doctor because of the hypersplenism it can occur number 2 because the anemia of the chronic disease is what need to be remembered in which condition normal osmolarity with the hyponatremia is seen at least on this question for the sake of juniors i'll take two more minutes of time please remember doctor hyperosmolar hyponatremia 
normal osmolar and hypo osmolar there are the three different values of the osmolarity where hyponatremia can exist there is only two, two important causes for the hyperosmolar hyponatremia number one if the patient is having diabetes with a hyperglycemia that can lead to hyperosmolarity and that can lead to development of the hyponatremia because all the water in the intracellular compartment is pulled into the extracellular compartment by this glucose and that leads to dilutional hyponatremia is what need to be remembered number two if you have given a lot of mannitol in a cerebrovascular accident patient that also can lead to the development of hyperosmolar hyponatremia how about isoosmolar hyponatremia two situations if the patient already is having a hyperlipidemia because he used to have the habit of eating two chicken every day so such an individual similarly hyperproteinemia because there is any multiple myeloma or any paraproteinemic state in these situations hyponatremia which is isoosmolar can occur both these varieties are a rare type of hyponatremia what is the most common variety of hyponatremia doctor it is the hypoospolar type of hyponatremia is what need to be basically remembered now once more when you have a hypoospolar hyponatremia you need to differentiate the patients into three groups look at his skin turgor is it a volume contracted state look whether there is any pedal edema or ascites is it a volume expanded state or there is no edema then it is a normal volume status these three groups can exist in the most common type of hyponatremia but in all this what is common osmolarity is low hypoosmolar hyponatremia so volume contracted states the diarrhea vomiting excessive sweating and poor water intake and diuretic use can lead to volume contracted with a hyponatremia whereas the syndrome of inappropriate adh secretion which leads to the hyponatremia no first thing before you diagnose this condition what is the prerequisite doctor there should not be any edema there should not be any adrenal disease or cardiac disease or endocrine disease so in the absence of congestive heart failure edema adrenal or uh, the disease of um, um, uh, which is predisposing to a hypovolemic state the presence of hyponatremia defines the sadh which is a diagnosis of exclusion then in congestive heart failure also you can find a hyponatremia which is basically hypoosmotic in nature so that's the reason doctor hyperlipidemia hyperproteinemia irrigation of bladder after tur these are all causes for the normal osmolar hyponatremia but not the chf which leads to a hypoosmolar hyponatremia is what you have to finally remember jejunal diverticulosis with steatorrhea what is the treatment of choice very interesting question now the question is diverticulitis is one condition and the bacterial overgrowth syndrome which can occur inside the diverticula is another condition in the diverticulitis treatment of choice is the metronidazole but in the case of the bacterial overgrowth syndrome typically it is uh, the tetracycline which is considered to be the best treatment there is also a role for the amoxicillin clavulanate also in the management but uh, those who have a jejunal diverticula with diabetes in such people it has got a better role than the tetracycline but otherwise unless proven for all cases of the non idiopathic bacterial overgrowth what do you mean by non idiopathic there is a proven diverticula which is leading to the bacterial overgrowth there the tetracycline is the treatment of choice